guides us um, through, our, through our lives. Uh, you are the only, whom do we have in heaven but you, God. You are the source of all good in our lives, and without you, there we have nothing. So help us to remember that and help us to praise you for everything that you do give us as we worship you this morning. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Our first hymn uh, today is His Name is Wonderful. And that, that made me think of the passage from Isaiah 9, uh, for, starting verse 6. This is uh, ordinarily, you know, reserved for Christmas time, but it's always good to hear it. For unto us a child born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establishment with judgment, excuse me, establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Uh, if you uh, look at the context, what's going on is there's this kind of crazy civil war situation going on between Judah and Israel, the Assyrian Empire getting involved. All this, all this stuff is happening. And maybe when people first heard this prophecy, they thought, good, God is finally going to send somebody to clean all of this up to restore peace and order and make Israel the most powerful nation in the world. We know now that God had much bigger plans in mind. This child, the son, did come. His name is, is Jesus. Amen. He is the Prince of Peace, and he has uh, established judgment, brought order, and saved us from something far more terrible than the Assyrian Empire. And that's what we celebrate today as we stand up and sing, His name is wonderful. <laughs>
and is uh, now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And uh, we here back on earth as his people, we eagerly await the return that he promised. Uh, the New Testament throughout, um, in, in many books of the New Testament, has uh, prayers asking for Jesus to come back quickly, to come soon. That's how the New Testament ends. You know, come Lord Jesus, come. And we have plans and hopes and dreams and aspirations for the future. These are great. We absolutely should have them. But we should at the same time be praying, come Lord Jesus, come. Because there is nothing in our lives, nothing in our future, nothing in our plans that even compares to the return of Christ and bring us back home with him. And so uh, we're going to sing about that now as we sing uh, the song, King of Heaven, uh, Come.
are dismissed as children of the church. There they go. Very good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Jonah. And as we've been going through it the last few weeks, Lord, we've come to the final chapter of Jonah. And it's kind of sad that, uh, to, to see it go through the sermon series, at least from my own heart and life. But, uh, Lord, I do pray that you would speak through it, that you would uh, use uh, uh, the simple words of your servant here, Father, to be able to communicate your word clearly to the hearts of every single person. Uh, Lord, if there is a change that needs to be made, if not in everyone's life, but in particular lives, Father, I pray they would see their need for repentance and they would turn to you. God, you're so good to us. You love us so much. Uh, Lord, I pray that people would be able to see that uh, today, even through the prophet Jonah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. In the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4, you can go ahead and turn there. In Jonah chapter 4, God uses several different illustrations. And I, I was thinking this week that if God is going to use actual illustrations to help teach the spiritual truth to Jonah, well then we probably are be good for us to use those same illustrations. So I'm going to do my absolute best with that. And I need some volunteers. So Adam, great, come on over. I have you in line for one. And let's see, uh, why don't we do Lexi and Jillian... And then Abby, Did that work? Okay. Now this is what I need you guys to do. Uh, you guys just look at Jonah chapter 4 and look it over for a while. I've got to explain a few things to that in just a moment. Come on down here. Right, now that I've got my helpers and my illustrations lined up, this will go much better. Since you've already read Jonah chapter 4, isn't that great? Yeah. See how that worked? Well, so if you don't like it, the Lord gave me this idea. So, you know, you can take it up with them later. But, but hopefully you'll be able to uh, understand this a little bit better. Uh, Jonah chapter 4, let's uh, remind ourselves of what's been going on in the book of Jonah. Jonah has been told of the Lord to go to the city, what city? Nineveh. Nineveh, and preach to it concerning the great wickedness in the city. And in 40 days, what's going to happen to the city? It'll be destroyed, very good. And so Jonah uh, uh, says in the first chapter, yes, Lord, whatever you say, Lord, I will do, I'll be obedient, I'll follow you to the end of the earth, Right? No, absolutely not. Jonah said, uh-uh, no way, Jose. And he was out. And he got out of there and he decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to figure out my own plan. And he went down to Joppa and he boarded a boat to go to, does anybody remember the city? Tarshish. Tarshish, very good. As far away from Nineveh as you could possibly find. And so he's on his way there and uh, the Lord prepared a great storm for the boat. Remember, you see that phrase a lot in the book of Jonah. And the Lord prepared a storm and they get Jonah up. He was sleeping and they say, well, how do I stop the storm the, storm the sailors do? And he says, he could have said, turn the boat around, head to the closest port of Nineveh. But no, he says, I'd rather die than obey God. And they throw him overboard. Now we see the great revival that takes place in the sailors' lives in that first chapter. And then when uh, Jonah is sinking in the water, uh, something happens to him fairly miraculously, uh, what happens? Swallowed by a great fish. Sometimes we call it a whale, but we don't know what, exactly what it is. Some creature that God had designed to swallow Jonah. And there he is in the belly of the fish. And it might have taken him three days, but finally at the third day, at least by the third day, he repents from his sin, and he calls out to his Lord in heaven again. And you see at the end of the chapter 2 that Jonah repents. Isn't that wonderful? So you have a repentive prophet Okay, everybody's with me, all right? Chapter 3, uh, the Lord allows the, the great fish to uh, deposit Jonah onto the shore again. And uh, there Jonah is, and he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches. And uh, by the end of chapter 3, what happens to the entire city? They all repent. It's amazing, 120,000 people, at least that can't determine between their left and the right. We believe that to be children, and then the, the parents. So you could have a city the size of St. Louis coming to know Christ, or coming to know God Almighty as, as their Lord and Savior. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. Wouldn't you be happy if the entire city of St. Louis repented in sackcloth and ashes? Yeah, I'll just take the town of Trenton. That'd be wonderful too, right? But I, it would be wonderful to be able to see that and know that. And if you were the one that was preaching God's message and God was using you for that, how wonderful that would be. But you don't see that. 
You've seen a repentant prophet in chapter 2, but now you see the pouting prophet. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are times in our Christian life we're just like Jonah. That God is doing some wonderful things. He may even be using you, but some of the ways you wanted your life to pan out and work out, you don't really care for it. And, and because of that, well, we can pout. <coughs> well, let's look and see if we're similar to Jonah. Uh, we'll start in chapter uh, 3, verse 10. It says, Then God saw their works, the works of Nineveh, the, those signs of repentance, and that they had turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now Jonah, the one that should have been doing a happy dance of joy, that all that happened, look at his heart. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Ever been there? God's doing something and you're angry. I don't like it that God's doing it. I don't want God to do this and now he's doing that. And I'm so frustrated at God. How dare he have a mind of his own? I'm supposed to pray and he's supposed to do what I tell God to do. Doesn't work that way, does it? Our God is sovereign. Uh, we are the ones that should worship him. Uh, yes, we have a mind of our own, but we need to bend to his will. He doesn't bend to our will ever. There's lots of passages where it actually says that God in heaven laughs when we make our own plans at times that have nothing to do with Him. He just simply laughs uh, as if we can control time and circumstances and so many other things. And here he is, Jonah, the pouting prophet, is angry that 120,000 people, at least 120,000 people repented and sat cloth and ashes. How sad it is. Look at verse 2. So Jonah prayed. Isn't that funny? I'm mad at God. So who, who, what's the next thing I'm going to do? I'm going to go talk to him. Let's see how this works out, right? You know, I'm angry with God, and so Jonah prayed. Look at verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I told you? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Do you feel Jonah kind of trying to yell at God here. Do you see it? Yeah, well, there we go. Somebody yelled over there. Are you? You kind of yell at God there a little bit. It's kind of ugly, right? What, what is Jonah yelling at God about? God, you're too what? You're too kind. God, you're too merciful. God, you're too forgiving. What you think about that? If God was not kind, what would have happened to Jonah in Jonah chapter 1? Fine. It would have been done. Squish. You know? No, you don't want to do what I say? Squish. Uh, if God wouldn't have been forgiving, what would uh, the fish have done to Jonah? Shoot him out. Yeah, yeah, gone. Uh, it wouldn't have been coming out on the shore any longer, right? It wouldn't be coming out of the mouth, all right? It would have been really, really bad. He would have been yeah, digested in the system, right? Um, yeah, God is incredibly merciful and incredibly kind to Jonah the prophet, and yet he's still frustrated by that. And there are a number of different things that you could say about Jonah. Um, we'll look at verse 3 and we'll kind of continue it. Uh, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. What does Jonah want to do? I'd rather lay here and die, God. How dare you have all these people repent and turn to you, God. How dare you be loving and kind and forgiving. I'd rather die and continue to follow you. Not a good place, let's just say. Not a real good place to be. Now there's several different little uh, illustrations that you can pull from an application to our own heart here. But some are fairly general. One is that when we don't get our way, what do we do? When Jonah didn't get his way, he pouted, got angry, and he pouted. When you don't get your way, what do you do? Do you get angry, and do you pout? Um, that we sometimes can do that. Now, I've grown past that. I don't do that anymore. But some of you, you know, I uh, talk to Heather and she'll tell you differently than that, right? Sometimes when I don't get my way, I can pout too. So there's a lesson there for me of seeing God as sovereign over these things. And that I don't have the right to pout. I don't have the right to be angry. And it's one of the questions that God will ask Jonah. Now, now there's another thing that we could look at. Do we get angry with God? When the life, uh, the way that our life is going isn't working out exactly the way we want it to. Uh, I, I, 
got to talk to several people uh, in the last three weeks or so that have said similar phrases to that, that they're mad at God because of this. And I went, well, well, why did this happen? And they started explaining, well, I know what God says in His Word, and I was doing something else, and I decided that that was the right way to go, and I was doing that thing. Okay, if I can paraphrase a little bit. I was doing that thing, and, and now all of a sudden my life isn't working out the way I wanted, wanted it to work out. And I'm like, it doesn't sound like God did anything to you. It sounds like you kind of did your thing, you know? I mean, you were the one that walked away from God, and now you don't like it. Well, well sure, you shouldn't like it. Uh, sometimes when we don't like the way our life is working out, we shouldn't get angry at God. We should turn back to God. We should go, okay, Lord, I, I, clearly I'm doing things wrong in my life, especially when we know outright that, that the reason that we're in this situation is because we chose to go against what God has said in His Word. Uh, and, and it's interesting to talk with people about that, that I said, well, God didn't make sense in His Word there. And your plan is, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not working out very well here at all. So sometimes we can get angry with God, even though that God really isn't at fault in, in that issue there. And sometimes He also brings those circumstances to bring us back to Him. But there's a more specific reason why Jonah is angry. It's not just simply that God didn't work out Jonah's master plan, but that Jonah didn't want those people coming to know his God. Those people were unclean. Those people were sinners. Those people... Well, they shouldn't have been the ones that got God's blessing and God's grace and mercy. Now, can that pop up in the heart and life of the average American today? Well, it does from time to time. And sometimes it's the issue of race. They're of a different race. They're of a different nationality. And I, I don't feel comfortable with them. Well, hey, God's got to work in your heart on that. Uh, we, we are one race, the human race. We're all from the blood of Adam and Eve. Uh, God created us that way. We all share that in common. We all have a soul. We're all created in the image of God, no matter what color or nationality that we are. And yet, sometimes people still feel uncomfortable. They say, well, I'll, I, I can go talk to my, my white neighbor, but my black neighbor, I just, I, I just don't know. Well, no, you do need to go do that. There's some of that, but not nearly as much. And sometimes it has to do with wealth, and every once in a while, I, hear little rumblings, I haven't heard this in several years, but well, we want particular people, they're trying to reach the mayor of Trenton because he's influential, and if, if he came to know Christ and came to our church, then, then maybe that would be kind of a positive thing. And yet, folks that are coming to the food pantry, we would go, well, uh, no, uh, that shouldn't be on our heart either. James chapter, or is it three, I think, James chapter two or three. Uh, communicates that to us, that there should be no partiality when it comes to the gospel and the preaching of God's word, and, and, and our hearts towards people. Sometimes it's not any of those sorts of things, it's just simply those people at work that have rubbed you the wrong way. That neighbor, that, that, that group of people. I, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with someone, uh, and, and I was trying to get them to pass out flyers on their street for the revival. And they said, oh, I, I, there's no way I want to go talk to so-and-so. And I'm like, why not? So, you just don't know what they are and how they are. They're just, they're just a mean individual. They're just da 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 They start filling, filling me in on how horrible this particular individual was. And you know what? All of that might be true. It <laughs> might be 100% true. But what is all of that ugliness just showing you their need of? Christ. They need Christ. So who should get the flyer? The jerk in the office should get the flyer, right? The ugly person should get the flyer. The, the one that you're just struggling with so much. They need Christ. Okay? And in the process, there might need to be some repentance in our own heart for even thinking those ugly thoughts about them. Jonah is there. This is a group of people that are repenting that I didn't want to repent. I wanted judgment to fall on, on the enemy of God. I didn't want God to be merciful and kind and gracious to them. Some of you may have ex-husbands, ex-wife that needs the gospel. Some of you may have various other relationships that have gone on that they need the gospel, and yet you've walled yourself off from them. And God would say, you need to care about them as much as I care about them. And that may be a tough thing to hear this morning, but it's a very important lesson that Jonah needed to learn. 
Look at Jonah chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, Then the Lord said uh, to Jonah, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Now, God loves to ask questions. Is it because he's trying to figure out your heart? Of course not. He already knows what's going on in your heart. Why does God ask questions so often in Scripture? So that you can get to your own heart. Our heart is deceptively wicked. Who can know it? Uh, and yet, the Lord knows our heart. The Lord knows that the right question. And that was the perfect question. And yet, Jonah blows it big time on several different reasons of why when it comes to that question. Look at verse 5 and how he uh, answers it in an action. Okay, in verse 5. Poor Jonah. Uh, verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city, and he sat on the east side of that city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it uh, 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 in the shade, till he might see what would become of the city. What does he already know that God's going to do? God's going to spare the city. They've repented. God is not going to bring disaster and judgment to the city because they've repented. We looked at that in Jeremiah 18 last week. That's what God had already communicated. If, if, if a group repents... God will relent from the disaster that comes to them. And so they've repented. Jonah, though, is figuring, maybe God will change his mind. And so maybe God will still give me what I want. And so he goes and he sits up on a hillside, and he pops some popcorn, and he starts to sit down to watch to see the, the fireworks show that God will destroy the city. And every passing hour that God doesn't do it, what do you think Jonah gets? Even though I got asked him the question, Jonah, should you be angry about this? The Jonah doesn't respond, but he goes and he sits and he pouts up on a hill and he watches the city and says, God, I'm angry. If you don't do what I say to do, I'm going to sit and watch and see what happens. And God, I'll get you. I have no clue how Jonah can do that, right? Uh, what Jonah does. And so God, to get to the heart of Jonah, uses these illustrations. It will say in the rest of the chapter, that God prepared three different things. And I think it's important. And sometimes God does this in our own life, and maybe God needs to do this to someone's life today. So, I know I'm not going to be mic'd, but hopefully you can still hear me. Okay? I'll try to talk loud. My hearing's going, so I talk loud anyway. So, so I, I think that will help here. Okay. And, uh, let's see. Come on over here. Adam is Jonah. Now, now, you have one large job. You have to whine. Can you whine? Yeah. Yeah, good. Whine as loud as you can for just a second. Oh. Very good. Does everybody see a whining prophet? Does everybody get that? A pouting prophet. A do the poochie little thing. What's that? Very good. You have to look sad and miserable. Can you look sad and miserable? Yeah. Okay, give me one more whine. Mm. Louder, come on. Okay, good. Seeing verses, and you'll see, I believe it starts at verse, is it 6 or 7? Six, thank you. In verse 6, it says, And God prepared a plant. And this is the first illustration that God prepared. So who's my plant? Okay, come on up here. This is for one hand there. This for another hand there. And you've got the shade over our pouting process. you got a shade. Don't hit him in the head. you just got a shade.
know, uh, that's the air conditioned area, that's the familiar situation, that's in the presence of your home, that you isolate yourself, and you don't even go talk to the neighbor about Christ. That might be happening in your own life right now, where you isolate yourself because you know those things, and that's a place of comfort. And yet God wants to take you out of that, because that's where ministry goes on. Yes, ministry happens at home in your family's life, but God wants you when it comes to evangelism to work outside the walls of your home and outside the walls of your church. I'm so thankful that you do come to church. I'm so thankful that this guy comes to church and he's a good guy that does what I ask him to do. All right? But it's more important that when you leave this building that you do the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord is easy inside this building. It's not easy outside. You get strengthened and encouraged and equipped to go out and do the work of the ministry. And sometimes we choose not to do that. And Jonah, well, even though he was speaking the words... He didn't have the heart of God when it came to the people of Nineveh. Okay, so shake my prophet again. Very good. And I should have brought my Bible down to do this. But, but, but the next verse, if you continue to read on in Jonah, will say not only that God prepared a plant and that Jonah was grateful for the plant, but then if you notice that God prepared something else, what is the next thing that God prepared? A worm. God prepared a worm. So where's my worm first? Okay, Abby. Abby's incredibly brave. I asked ahead of time. That's great. These are actual worms. Yes. <laughs> you just be the whining prophet. Okay, this is working. Oh my god! What I want you to do is just pull out a worm and just place it on one of the branches. Oh! 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 You can do it.
wanted to show you those particular illustrations, if you would, because that's what God does with Jonah. The, the, the sermon was taught by the plant, by the worm, and by the hot wind to get to the heart of Jonah. And there are times that God does this in your life, if not on a daily basis, that he'll bring something across your path that doesn't contradict scripture, but drives home the point of the word of God in your life. To say, listen, listen to me. Answer the question that I'm presenting in your heart. It's important. And the beautiful thing about that is that yes, God is the God of the revival that 120,000 plus people come to know uh, Him at. But God is also the God that cares about each individual heart. Even a prophet, even a person that has been pouting and whining and is not living his life very pleasing unto the Lord. Uh, look at verse 9 through 11. God, look at verse 9 through 11. Uh, God, uh, um, continues to talk to Jonah. Jonah chapter 4, verse 9, it says this, Then God said to Jonah, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, notice how much whining and how much complaining is doing. What does he say? Oh no, Lord, it's not right. You've gotten to my heart, God. No, I repent in sackcloth and ashes, right? No. No. He said, yes, Lord. It is right for me to be angry about a plant. You took my comfort, God. That's what you did. And I'm so angry I could die. How ugly that is for Jonah to respond back to God. But it's his true feelings. Look at verse 10 and 11. But the Lord said, Jonah, you have pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which it came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? God's great question comes to him again. And God explains to Jonah, you pity the plant, Jonah, but you didn't pity the Jonah, you, you, your heart lived for the shade, but it didn't live to reach the center of the Christ, or to the center for the Lord. The wonderful thing about Jesus is that he came to reach the hearts of sinners. And my heart was just one of those. A sinful heart which he reached. And I'm so thankful for that. And I have heard almost every single person's testimony, but... We have a few visitors today. I have heard your testimonies or so, but the majority of you have heard your testimonies, and your testimony is the same. I'm a sinner that Christ saved. You know, outside these walls are many people, and some, we really enjoy their company. They're easy to get along with. If God said, I want you to go preach to them, we go, no problem, it'd be easy to do. But there are some folks that live around us and work with us, go to school with us, that have God said, I want you to reach them, that we may say, no, Lord, not them. And although we might not get on a boat, we keep our mouth shut, because our heart isn't tender to what God really wants in our life. That our heart craves the comfort, the comfort of not being rejected by a group of people, maybe. Or the comfort of just sitting at home and watching a cardinal ball game and not going and sharing the gospel with anyone. It's important, folks, to share that good news. And God has given us a great opportunity here. We have a revival, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And for, I first want to thank you so much for people responding to our sermon series we've been going on about revival. I also want to thank you so much for those that have been going and trying to talk with neighbors. I know we've covered a lot of streets in Trenton and in New Baden and several other areas. Thank you for doing that. But maybe you still haven't done that. It's not too late. The revival's Friday. You still have an opportunity, but be willing to do that. So I've got several opportunities here for you. One is Tuesday. 
This Tuesday at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock every Tuesday, I go out and I try to visit folks that have either visited our church or uh, that you've given me names of people to visit that need the gospel. I try to go do that. And we've been going door to door lately throughout our community just to invite them to the revival time. This Tuesday at 5 o'clock, I'm going out again. I would absolutely love it if you would go with me. And if we have six people, we'll go out in teams of two like we've been doing. I love it. I, if we have 60 people, I'd love that too. I will cry, but then I will uh, praise God and give you a hug, and then we will go do what, I, uh, do what the Lord wants us to do on that. If 5 o'clock doesn't work for you, and some of you work, and I get that, I know that. Some of you aren't able to, to do a lot of the walking. I get that too. But you're able to pick up the phone and call someone. Go ahead and do that. Or maybe you say, I can't do that at 5 o'clock, but on Wednesday at 3 o'clock, I can Come talk with me. I have all the streets that haven't been gone down, and I can give you a section and say, would you cover that section for me? That would be a huge help. Please do that. That's Tuesday. Now I have one other thing that's just as important. Every Wednesday we have a prayer meeting. I have a faithful group of people that come and pray every week, and they are an absolute blessing. And I've got some folks that they come when they can, and it's a blessing too. But I'd love to see you. Usually we have somewhere around 10 people show up to pray on Wednesday. Would you come and pray for the revival time? I know that you have someone in your life that needs Christ. Maybe they're coming to the revival. Maybe they can't come, but you know they still need Jesus. Would you come and would you pray this Wednesday? That's at 7 o'clock. Now that works a lot better at most of your work schedules. And don't tell me your kids are going to bed at 7. Because I don't think they are. All right, maybe a little early on that. So come. Come and pray with me. Come and pray for God's, uh, God to work in the hearts and lives of people. That's Wednesday at 7 o'clock. What day is that? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, good. Everybody's with me. And then the revival starts Friday. It starts with the farm hands. I know they'll do a great job. They've got good testimonies and they're good artists. And Ron Trum will be here and preach a miniature sermon that day. Uh, geared towards the gospel. Please encourage people to be there. Uh, even if uh, you have to use the hook of the farmhands to bring them, that's fine. Use that. But they're going to hear the gospel. That's going to be, was it at 7 o'clock? At 7 o'clock? Somebody help me with that? Yeah. Yeah. 7 o'clock. Very good. 7 o'clock. Saturday is our meal time at 6 o'clock. And then right about the time we start doing desserts and people start going to the lines for desserts. I know most of you get desserts at the beginning of the time too. But about the time the desserts normally are served, Ron Strum will get up and he'll start preaching. Listen, it's great opportunities. Please be inviting folks to that. It's not too late to invite them. And I also recognize that as we've been preaching on revival for four weeks now, that you may feel very much like Jonah. Maybe you in your Christian life have been very angry, very pouting towards God about something going on in your life. I want to give you an opportunity as the praise team comes to get that right with your life. And maybe you're here today and you were like the sailors on the boat or the people of Nineveh that repented, even as I hope by the end of chapter 4 that's not recorded for us, I hope that Jonah truly repents from his hard-heartedness towards people. Maybe you've never asked Christ to save you. This is an opportunity for you to do that. Deacons, just like last Sunday, would you help me? Would you go to the four corners? Uh, folks, I do that with the deacons lately so that there's someone there waiting for you. You don't have to run down and see me. You're welcome to come down and see me. So go to one of these deacons. Come to me. Get that right with the Lord. If you're nervous about that, Tap somebody uh, on the shoulder next to you or the hand next to you. Would you go with me just to pray with me? They'll do it. I know they will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. You've given us a great opportunity not to harden our heart towards people like Jonah. And God, I hope and pray that you got to the heart of Jonah. You use unique illustrations that in my meager way I tried to do too. Oh Lord, I can be a big complainer um, powder when I don't get my way, uh, even frustrated with the way you're doing things, God. But, God, your plans are always right. You're always good. Your plans are always just. 
And Lord, may I never have the heart of someone that is frustrated at how good you are uh, and gracious you are to save sinners. But Lord, I pray that if we have walled our heart off to certain people, that we say, I'll witness to this person, but never to that person. I'll show kindness to this person, but never to this person. I count them as my enemy. Lord, I pray that you would tear down that wall and that they would, uh, we would be willing to go and tell them the gospel. Lord, if there is someone here today that has never put their faith and trust in you, Lord, I pray that you would work, you would use your spirit now to show them that yes, they are a sinner, but that God loves them, that sent his son to die for them, and that they can have a relationship with him, and they can be a, a, a redeemed person, a forgiven person. Lord, I pray they would tap somebody on their shoulder or just get up where they're at, even now, and just head out to one of the four corners and meet with someone that would lovingly share the gospel with them. Or come talk with me that they can know the truth of the gospel and come to know Christ as your Savior today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing that closing song. And if you need to go anytime during the song, just head out to one of the four corners. Come on up here.
maybe there's been some stuff going on in your life. Say, so just need to be right with God. That's what we're here for as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you've got something going on in your life, Christ is there. He can forgive you. Right? Don't leave today with something on your heart. Please don't do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for how you've been working in the hearts and lives of people. I'm excited to see what you'll do during the revival time. Lord, I pray that you really would uh, touch our lives. Use your spirit in a very powerful way to move amongst us, to convict us of things that we're not doing right, uh, but to point sinners to the wonderful grace of Jesus. Uh, Lord, uh, may it be a very refreshing time for our church uh, at, at this revival time. Well, Lord, help us with those that we're going to invite, uh, maybe a few more that we're still looking to invite. Uh, Lord, bring the people across our path that, that need you, that need to, to come and hear the gospel. And Lord, would you bring them, uh, bring them to be able to hear.